And you too, Alan. Thank you. Now sit down, baby self. This morning, bless your hearts, my voice is <coughs> struggling a little bit. But we'll get out what we need to get out, amen? Uh, there's a symbol of a kind of a first aid on the wall. That's for a reason, because uh, after being in the hospital systems with my wife for the last several weeks, I've come up with a great sermon. <laughs> In fact, I'll tell you right off the bat, I remember my brother Phil preaching something like this many years ago, and I scribbled out the notes on an old yellow piece of paper. Three years ago in Belize, the Lord put that on my heart, and I went digging and stuff and found out, you know, to, to speak in Belize, uh, the, this particular message, and I've uh, added sense to it, Phil, but you can still have editorial privileges. All right, where's this thing? Here it is. The message is called, The Symptoms of Sick and Dying Christian. So it's appropriate for all that have been in the hospital around so many sick and dying people here the last few weeks. Uh, you get a real fresh glimpse of how so many of those things parallel our spiritual condition. And uh, just as much as we're so often prone to look at all our physical symptoms and maladies and see what's going on, I think it's important we realize there are some spiritual symptoms as well. That we may not be well. In fact, we may be very sick. In fact, you know, unless something's done, it might be terminal. Uh, if we don't see some repair take place or pay some attention very quickly to it. So uh, I thought there would be an appropriate message to share with you this morning. I'll find one of my pair of glasses in a minute. Did I leave them back there again? Anyway, we're good anyway. So don't anybody bring me anything, I'm fine. <laughs> so, many, so many people with the gift of helps around here, amen. I, I don't know who it's been, but I tell you, since that one Sunday a few weeks ago when I left my readers, uh, every... Monday, when I walk in from Sunday services, coming back on Monday, there's at least two or three pair of readers on my desk. For all you people who had your cataract surgery, I know who you are. <laughs> so quit giving me your old readers. I mean, I got plenty. But as we look at this message today, I, I really want to show you some things here that, that are so parallel and, you know, so related to where we are spiritually. And just as much as we would want to be in good, decent physical condition, we need to be in good spiritual condition. In fact, you never realize how much you appreciate being in good health until you're not. Amen? And it gives you a whole new appreciation for what we take for granted so often. So when we look at this today, as we look at, first of all, in this message, we'll look at some of the symptoms, and then we'll see how we need to treat these particular symptoms as we go through it. Now, the first one is the most problematic because it begins to usher in all the other problems that follow up. It's kind of like when you start with that first sniffle, you know that, oh, there's something, I got this tickle in my throat, the sniffle, I'm going to get a little, you know. You know that there's signs that are going on or something starts breaking down in the, the order of your physical body. Say, uh, this is leading up to something, something's not good. Many times, if you're a man in the crowd, you'll wait till it gets worse, until it just gets so out of hand, there's not too much you can do about it. But I would encourage each of you this morning to be willing to take a spiritual exam. I know it's exciting. Just about as exciting as a physical exam. I know when the last time you had a full physical routine exam done, but they're not fun. You know, they pinch, they poke, they prod, they stick in places they have no business. Amen. And then they come back with their prognosis and their diagnosis and their treatment. Well, today it may not feel good at different times in this message, but I would encourage you to bear with the, the, the symptoms list because we will move from there to the to the things that we can do to change where we're at and to somehow expedite a cure for what we're experiencing in our spiritual life at this time. Uh, now, first of all, I would say as we start the symptom list, the main reason most of us get this way and with these, phys these spiritual maladies in our life is due many times to toxics and toxins that we ingest in our life. Remember, we're talking spiritually speaking. The things that you just shouldn't be taking in as a believer that you should leave alone. And the more that you participate and partake in these particular things, they are toxic to your spiritual walk in your spiritual life. But one of the first evidences so, ever shows up so slightly and so subtly is this thing called weakness. You know, you're just, you know, you're just short of breath. You just don't have the energy to do what, what God's called you to do. It seems that you just, you know what the Lord wants, but you're just not getting there. And it's just tiring and it's difficult. And a lot of people in our church right now are experiencing this. And it is, it is communicable, so be careful who you fellowship with. 
Amen. They just get weak. And it's that thing we get, I'm tired, Brother Joe. I'm just so tired. I can't do what God wants me to do. I think the Lord wants me not to do it anymore. That is close to being blasphemous when you say those words. Always be cautious of saying, the Lord told me. Because to be blasphemous means to use the Lord's name in an appropriate manner or to speak ill of the Lord. So let's be cautious when we say, well, it's the will of God. It's the will of God. Let's always be sure we know it's the will of God before we state that something is the will of God. Amen. But the weakness enters in. I just got so much going on. My life's so busy. And so, hey, if your life's too busy for God, then your life's way too busy for the world. You know, and you need to reprioritize. And I know that's a hard thing to do because we think, you know, we, we're needed in so many places in our thinking in the world. But weakness enters in, and with that weakness comes this second thing that leads, if we don't deal with that, is the inability to stand up. We just lose our capacity to stand, to stand our ground, to stand up for any length of time. And of course, you know we're dealing with spiritual issues, so I'm talking in regard to having the ability to stand for righteousness, the ability to stand for truth, the ability to stand your ground in temptation, the ability to stand up when everything else says leave or sit down or quit or stop. And you get to that point, you're just weak and you lose in the context of just being able to stand. The Bible says, having done everything to stand. Now, if you follow this flow of that, and Tim's been preaching on Ephesians, so I won't go there that much. But I would say, if you follow the way that letter to the Ephesians is written, there are certain things you do to stand. It deals with your spiritual vision, your appetite, your, your spiritual wardrobe, the clothing, your, your prayer life, the disciplines of caring and loving other believers. Having done all those things that you should be doing in your natural order of your spiritual living, then you stand. Having done all to stand, stand. And then we stand praying. But what happens is people lose the capacity to stand. We, we don't stand for what's right. We don't stand against what's wrong. We, 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 we kind of get to the place where we just, we just don't seem to have the unction to function in that regard. Now, that works in correlation to this next thing, aches and pains. And they usually get to the point where there are aches and pains all over. Everything's a soreness. Every, you know, every person is just like a sore spot. You know, it's like I don't want to deal with that, or I don't want to deal. It just so much. It it just takes too much out of me. And you know, you get you just get where you sore to everybody. You know, the, one of the one of the big symptoms here that lines up with these things is this attitude of cynicism. The world kind of turns around you now and everything. You have a cynical approach to people, a cynical approach to the world, cynical approach to the things of God and what God's doing in your life. You just can't put all the pieces together anymore. You know, you, then it turns to a soreness at everybody else. You've lost the attitude to, to really comprehend what it means to, to have sacrificial service and sacrificial love in your life. And when you get to that place, it's because these things are adding up. Now, here's the problem. They just don't stop. They keep getting worse and they keep getting worse unless something is done to change the tide of what you're looking at. Now this aches and pains, it, it, it ends up now with worries and fears and doubts and life's a pain and people are a pain and your job's a pain and the church is a pain, and pastor's a pain, you know, lift group's a pain. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. I've always been amazed at how we just, we easily are sold that bill of goods, you know, in our spiritual life. We just get, we, we buy that. Well, I'm just, they just don't understand my situation. No, you don't understand your situation. And so it's important that, you know, that we're, we, when we get to the point where I'm going to the doctor to find out what's wrong with me, or I'm listening to the pastor to find out what's wrong, that I have an honest, open interrogation and an introspection spiritually of my own heart and life. Because what happens if we don't start dealing with this, then comes loss of vision. Here's how you can know you're losing your vision. It starts out with double vision. You know, and, and, and one side it's the world, the other side it, 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 it's the word. You know, one side it's the devil, and the other side it's a God. And, and there's this blending back and forth where you're losing the capacity to focus on, on the right things. And you start focusing on the wrong things. And although they're out here on the edges of your peripheral vision, you know, you, you, every once in a while you kind of get back over here, but the, you've lost the, the, the so-called stamina to, to focus on the things that are higher instead of and, and, and focusing now on the things that are lower. You're not focusing on things above, you're, you're focusing on things below. And, and Apparently, it gets to the point where you lose your sight. Now, Peter wrote the church and he said, listen, it is possible for you to become so far away from God that you lose sight that you were even a saved child of God. Here's what happens. It, this loss of vision, when it begins to set in, it doesn't improve if you don't change some things in your life. 
It just stays the same. And you start getting more narrow-minded and narrow vision in the purposes of the world and self and what you want, what you like, and what your desires are, and what you, you, you're wanting to see done. And now you've lost the, the capacity to hate it. You don't see the way God wants you to see. You, you don't see the kingdom anymore. You don't see the kingdom. You see your world. That's it. Your little surroundings. My family, my, my car, my house, my job, my, my this, what. And it's just, it's right here. And you lose the kingdom mindset. You lose the, with that goes that, that, the attitude of service mindset. Where can I serve God? Where am I plugged in? What am I doing for the glory of God? And you've lost the, the vision that said, hey, I, am, I belong to Jesus. Uh, my father's God. I, I am a child of God. <clears throat> I am in the family of God. I even have a job description. I am called an ambassador for Christ. In fact, my ambassadorship is, is described as being light and being salt. Someone who gets into the world around them, instead of being motivated and fluctuated and frustrated by my surroundings, I'm now being the one who's making the difference. I'm no longer the thermostat kind of judging the temperature, the, the thermometer. I become the thermostat to set the temperature. But when we lose vision, we lose that. We just kind of fit in the mold, go along with the, 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 the ebb and flow of whatever else is going on. You know, and if church is that, we'll plug in church occasionally. But, you know, we just lose the fact that God has something for me. God's got something bigger than me. God's got something he's up to in my life and through my life. And all that is going on around me, good, bad, up, down, it's all for the glory of God. And I said glorify God in all of it. But with the loss of vision, you come to that place where you just don't see it. Now, I know this may be hard for some, but here's what happens. In a spiritual sense, remember, we're talking, there's a loss of appetite. Now, I know some of you had not dealt with that in the physical sense, but you have lost your appetite spiritually. That desire for the milk of the word, the meat of the word. There's not, there's not a hunger for it anymore. Not, you know, it, it, you're satisfied with, you know, it, it's, with just something that's it's thrown out there for you, like coming to church and the pastor preaches a sermon. But you've heard me use the illustration before, you know. That's ABC food, what I'm giving you. That's already been chewed. I've chewed on it. I'm getting lots of nutrients out of it. There's some for you, all right? But, it, 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 you know, there's, there's that, that model picture you get in the animal kingdom where the older animals, the parent animals, chew up the food for the babies in the beginning, you know, and then give it to them. Now, I know that sounds gross, but... Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's the way it comes. If, if, if that's all we're getting, then that's about the only value it's going to serve for us. If it's, not, if it's not mixed with my own commitment to Christ, my own commitment to study, my own commitment to the Word, you know, it, it's kind of like they've already been chewed. It's like, like I told people, you know, my year in first grade of school, I said, they said, what do you like about first grade? I, I, I said, you know, the complimentary gum under the desk. Oh, you get a minute, but <laughs> that's a bit gross, isn't it? I'm sorry, Kathy. Kathy, see, I got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> the idea is that there's got to be an appetite for spiritual things. And if there's no appetite for spiritual things, you're sick. There's something going on. You've got a fever. And you pay attention. That's, there, that's, that's happening like that for a reason. All right? And many times, it, it's, it's in the, in the, like in the physical sense, we're eating the wrong things, not eating the right things. We're eating junk food. We're not really, you know, we're not really, you know, taking the time to, to nourish ourselves in the things that matter in regard to our own spiritual disciplines and our own spiritual walk. We lose our appetite. But also, this all compiles again as we go down the list. It compiles now to what cr creates a, in, in, our, in our very spirit is this loss of hearing. We're not hearing here anymore. Oh, we're hearing our physical ears, but we're not hearing God speak. We're not hearing God's word speak to us. We're not studying the word of God, so we're not familiar anymore. It's like we're losing context of to hear what we need to hear. You know, as you get older, you certainly start losing the, the capacity to hear certain frequencies, all right? You know, I pretty much lost all the hearing in my right ear. That's because when we played a lot of rock and roll music, I always had my right ear to the guitar amp, so some of you musicians know what I'm talking about, right? It's just gone on that side. So I, I, you know, if I don't want to hear Kathy talking, I just roll over on the other side, you know? <laughs> she knows if I'm laying on my left side, I, I'm just, I need, yeah, honey. <laughs> but we do that with God. You know, we just turn a deaf ear to God. How often does the scripture tell us, hey, especially in the book of Revelation, the last word to the church is hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. Having done all to hear, we need to hear. 
We need to open up our ears. We need to come with an anticipation to the Word of God, whether it's our devotion, whether it's our list Bible studies, whether it's the women's study, the men's study, whatever it is, to, to, to church. I need to hear something from God. I'm hungry. There's an appetite. And so I want my ears to hear truth. I want to hear what's going on. Now, <clears throat> this continues to affect us. The second, the, the next stage in, in the secondary starts moving to a whole new realm. Now, now, now we lost our, our, our vision and we lost our hearing, but now sets in this problem. And this is really one, this can flip either way with this one and the next one. It would be laryngitis, spiritually speaking. You know, we just lose capacity. We're doing real good. We talk about the Super Bowl. Ah, I'm picking, I'm picking, you know, Cam Newton and the Panthers over there by 24 points, you know. No, 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 it's going to be, you know, Denver. All, and we're good about talking about that. Talking, you know, sports talking whatever our favorite subject and topics are, talking weather. But when it comes to spiritual things, being bold and strong, not weak, then there's this capacity when we're really right with the Lord, it's no problem at all just to sound out the gospel. Hey, I'm tell you, by the way, has anybody ever told you about Jesus? Or do you, do you even understand what the Bible teaches about the gospel and about the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever heard the good news, the gospel message? But now it's just there, John. You know, and we lose the capacity to just speak. Now, on the flip side of that is this one. We call it the loss of the control of our tongue. We're talking, but all the wrong things. This is where gossip enters in. Have you heard so-and-so at the church is doing this? Well, I heard so-and-so is leaving the church. I heard so-and-so. I heard so-and-so. I, you know, I think they're messing around with their wife. What, what I heard. What'd you hear? Let me tell you what I heard. Well, I heard some more than that. You, what'd you hear? <clears throat> now, we're in such poor, poor spiritual condition at this point that this gets real easy. In fact, the Bible talks about the power of the tongue and it's a fire, you know, set on fire, hell itself. And it's real easy to get in the chippy little snippety back talk, uh, gossip, and, you know, all that stuff that goes along with it. So if you find yourself in the mode, you know, having laryngitis in regard to the gospel, but really being able to talk about other people, then you're sick. The Bible talks warning upon warning upon warning about the dangers and the hazards of talking about other people in a negative way, in a critical way, in a judgmental way. And there's warning after warning that describes the spiritual condition of our life with people who are like this. The Bible talks about Brooks Proverbs that don't even fellowship with people like that. If you have a friend that's a gossip and likes to gossip and loves to gossip, yeah, and that's the world around us. I mean, look at all the gossip shows out there. I mean, half the news networks are just gossip shows. And then you add all the other TMZs and Hollywood Insights and all. It's just all gossip shows. Everybody loves gossip, gossip, gossip. You know, they say, you hear about so-and-so. Yeah, I heard about so-and-so. I mean, you know, I about so-and-so. Well, I heard about him too. You know that commercial? Help, I've fallen, I can't get up. It's that help, I'm talking and I can't shut up. <laughs> Amen. That's because you have this lost control of your tongue. And the only thing that controls the tongue is, is, is the Holy Spirit of God filling your heart and life. Now, it seems to, to work its way and course itself through our spiritual body and conditions. So the next thing you have to deal with this issue called, we'll call it reflux and regurgitation. You know, there's a lot that goes on in the spirit of a, of a Christian, in the heart of a Christian when they're not right with the Lord. There's a lot of conviction. There's a lot of wooing by the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of self-guilt and even self-condemnation. You add to that, Satan loves it when you're backslidden because he just keeps heaping on condemnation, right? So that creates a lot of gas and a lot of acid and a lot of reflux that goes on, you know? And no matter how many tums you take, it will not solve because this, I believe, also affects us with, with the spiritual affects us even with, with physical reflux. I believe that. And with that, if it doesn't stop there, then it's just all the way regurgitation. Now, that's a nicer word from the dictionary that I could find for the word vomit. There's nothing pretty about the word vomit. But the Bible talks about vomit, you know. Uh, you, some of you may remember I shared your story many years ago about preaching at Spring Baptist Church when I was in evangelism. You know, and it was on Easter Sunday. It was, we started the crusade on Sunday morning and Sunday night where there the house was full Easter Sunday. You know, I'm getting up to preach and all of a sudden I'm starting to feel woozy. I've been in the pulpit three minutes perhaps. Started my sermon introduction and I'm thinking, oh, I just stopped and said, folks, I said, I'm, I'm really not feeling well right now. I said, we just need to pray. <clears throat> I said, uh, so I stopped and led us all in prayer and prayed for myself, laid hands on myself, you know, and 
So we're going to get through this sermon. Boy, I'm looking at the paper, and I preach this sermon a lot of times in a lot of revivals, so I wasn't worried about notes or anything. I'm just watching the page go back and forth, and boy, I'm feeling my stomach flip, and I'm getting real light. I feel like I'm getting ready to pass out. And so I'm thinking in my mind, I'm going to get through this sermon. Well, about five minutes down the road from that, no telling what I'd said, that's it. I'm either going to pass out or throw up or something. So I just, I said, listen, I've never done this in a, in a crusade that I've ever preached in, folks. I apologize. But I'm going to turn the service over to Dr. Kate, who was the pastor at that time. And he'll take the service from here. I apologize. And I stepped off and made my way to one of the side doors. It was about from here to there in that church building from where I was at. Walked down the steps, got out the door, shut the door behind me, and then regurgitated, vomited. Now, that would have been all right. I finally made it past the doors. Nobody saw it. But the guy in the sound booth got to turn my mic off. You know. And it's not once. I mean, I'm looking for the bathroom, leaving a trail for the deacons to clean up, you know. All the way. It's just, oh, and, and then somebody comes running and says, Are you ready to go back and preach now? You know, sometimes you feel better. So get out of here before I kill you. You know, I'm not going back in there now. We'll come back tomorrow night. I got up the next night to preach. I just, I confessed, said, Folks, I'm sorry. I said, I've discovered thoroughly now that there's no cool way to vomit. We remember what we said about vomit before. It's something that looked good at one time. <laughs> Didn't it? It looked good at one time. But so did our sin and so did our folly. In fact, the book of Proverbs says like the fool returns to his folly, just like a, 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 a dog returns to his vomit. In other words, it looked good at one time. We try to go back as Christians, but it's never any good. It's never what it was because we were sinners and it satisfied the appetite. But sin will never satisfy the appetite of the believer. He's just never happy. It just gets worse and you get more despondent and it gets more difficult. Now, along with this, in the process, there's some other symptoms that manifest themselves externally. Like there's a severe tightness in the wallet. In the wallet. Brother Phil calls it paralysis of the giver. <laughs> You just don't give like you used to. You don't care about giving like your missions and other things and tithing. I've got problems. You know, I've got situations. How, how is it that when we get into problems in our life, the first thing we do is start limiting God? I got problems, so I'm not going to give God as much time as I used to. I got problems, so I'm not going to give God as much money as I used to. I got problems, so I'm not going to go to church like I used to. The, the ins that's the insanity of this double vision problem. You don't see, you don't hear, you don't comprehend the things that used to make sense. And they just know, you know, they don't make sense like they used to, which is one of the problems. It all boils down because we, now we're not focused on eternal issues. We're focused on our, our earthly, external, temporal issues, which leads to many cases, depression, real depression. And we can experience depression for a lot of reasons, but I tell you, many times Christians experience it is because of these other things they're setting in. You know, we've lost that vision of the glory of God in our life, the power of God in our life, the call of God in our life, the purposes of God in our life, the beautiful grace of God in our life. We've lost vision of the side of the cross, God's son dying for me. That lifts despair. We just say, oh, Brother Joe, I'm just having a downtime. Not really experiencing much victory. I'm just in a battle. Lord, it's hard. It's hard. Things are difficult. And we're consumed by them. That also leads to another manifestation called insomnia. We don't sleep good. We don't get full rest when we sleep. Why? Like I said, the Holy Spirit working in us is drawing us and convicting us about our failure and our sin. Not to condemn us. He doesn't do that. He's convicting us. He's drawing us back to Jesus, drawing us back to life, drawing us back to fullness, drawing us back to peace, drawing us back to victory. And we're resisting. And so we're living in despair because of our resistance. And add to that, Satan doesn't stop. I mean, you thought that when you bowed out a little bit and quit being so committed and on fire for Jesus that he was going to back off. Sorry, he lied. By the way, he is a liar. He'll promise you all those things. You're just doing too much. If you back off, that would be so hard. And he's a liar. Anytime you choose to listen to what he has to say, you're headed down tombstone to territory. I mean, you're on your way to death row. It's a miserable place to be. So despair and depression and insomnia. Add to that 
the self-inflicted guilt. I know I'm not right with God. So that's going on. So there's this turmoil. So we don't sleep like we should. And here's the worst of it. It affects us mentally as well as emotionally and physically. We, we just become irrational. We can't be reasoned with. I mean, people say, I say, you know what you really need to do? <laughs> I'm going to tell you the simple truth. Here's what you ought to do. You ought to, you ought to get with God and get things right with God. Get your heart turned back over Him. Get back to those simple commitments and love and fellowship and the disciplines of fellowship. Spending time with God, getting this. And I, just, I did all that. I did all that. Now, what you did was some religious works. What we're talking about is fellowship. What we're talking about is relational, not just kind of oriented to some kind of list that you have to go through. And what, but we, 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 we've lost concept and the context of what the, what, what the Word of God says, which leads to this. It's, it gets down to this. It's, it's memory loss. Over and over through Psalms, you see David in different situations of difficulty, sometimes even despair. But he always comes back to this. He said, you know what happened? I forgot the great works of God. He tells them in Psalm 73, Psalm 73 says, hey, remind the children to remember the great works of God. Keep bringing up the promises of God and the covenant promises of God and the greatness of God and look back and see the miracles of God, all that he's done. He's not dead. He didn't retire since then. You know, he hadn't been laid off. He's still God. He's still on the throne. Remember what God is. He will not, uh, he's not going to fail you in this. He's not going to bail out on you. He's faithful. He's going to be there. He's going to meet your need. He's your God. But we just, we lose, we lose sight of that and our memory's gone to those things. And what happens, we get to this place where our, our count is down, you know, infections are setting in. Our blood count changes at this point. We get our low, what they call a low count within our blood and, you know, uh, infection seems to start winning the race and winning the prize and, and winning the victory in our life because we don't come back to the cross and apply the blood of Jesus to our situation. We don't come back to the cross and remember the blood of Jesus shed for our sins. We don't come to the cross and see the price that it took for you and I to be in the family of God and to be the children of God. We quit confessing our sins. We get, con we get, we, we, we get tolerant of our sins. We, we don't mind being you know, stir it up a little bit in church about him, say amen, and maybe even come to the altar and pray a little prayer, but we don't deal with it. We don't, we don't experience true repentance. And let me tell you, folks, when we get to this place, it is the most, where did these come from? <laughs> Loss of memory. <laughs> I'll take a drink of water on that. I need a drink. I don't know what you put in this, but it's good. <laughs> Oh, bear with me and my follies, Apostle said. It's a miserable place to be. If you've been in this situation or you are in this situation, nobody has to convince you. It's not a fun place to be in your spiritual walk in life. Let me read you a quote from a, from a theologian by the name of John Charles Ryle. Dr. Ryle said this, and it's, it's that paragraph here, so bear with me, because it is so appropriate. Listen carefully. He says, it is a miserable thing to be a backslider. Of all unhappy things that can befall a man, I suppose backsliding is the worst. A stranded ship, a broken winged eagle, a garden overrun with weeds, a harp without strings, a church in ruins. All these are sad sights, but a backslider is a sadder sight still. That true grace shall never be extinguished. True union with Christ can never be broken off. I feel no doubt, but I do believe that a man or a woman may fall so far away that they lose sight of their own grace and despair of their own salvation. And if this isn't hell, it is certainly the next thing to it. A wounded conscience, a mind sick of itself, a memory filled with self-reproach, a heart pierced through with the Lord's sorrows and arrows, a spirit broken with a load of inward accusation. All this is just a taste of hell. It's hell on earth. We have got to get to that place of discontentment with our spiritual condition before we'll ever have revival in our lives. We've got to come to that place of dissatisfaction. And this is a miserable place I've been living in. Folks, you don't have to be out of church to be backslidden. Most of the backsliders I know are in church. 
What do you do? Pretty simple suggested treatment. One is quarantine. You're going to have to get with God alone. This is going to take some time to get with the Lord and have him search your heart. As David, the psalmist said, Lord, search me. See if there's any harmful or wicked way in me. God, show me, show me what's really going on here. Sometimes we have surmised in our mind what the real problem is, and it is so far from what is right and what is the correct view and what's the proper truth. And we just, But we're convinced that that's it. And you don't see it until you really get with God and say, God, what's really going on in my heart and life? Because we'll blame our wife, we'll blame the pastor, we'll blame the church, we'll blame everybody and everything. Next thing is get back to commitment of a strict spiritual diet in your life. Replace all the toxic things that you've been taking in your life with the things that you need. Getting in the Word, getting in prayer, spending time with God. God. That's a necessity. You can't walk with God and you won't walk in victory with God if you're not in fellowship. These are the things that deepen the fellowship. Time with God, the prayer, time with the Word. These are the things that make the difference. Just, you, there's no substitute for discipline. I'm amazed that so many people, they'll just be sick and be content with it. I remember my father was going through, through my grandfather was going through cancer treatment down the medical center. I remember going down there and, and visiting him and coming out of the hospital past where they do the day, sur the day treatments for cancer patients, you know. And there'd be at least 20, 30 people sitting on benches out in front of the hospital, you know. Uh, oxygen tanks beside some of them, you know. Walkers on some, some sitting in wheelchairs waiting for the chemo. <coughs> Smoking a cigarette. <laughs> the insanity of our sin? You say, that is ridiculous. I can't believe it. But look at our lives. How often have we been the same way? You know what it is that's causing the problem. Why do you keep feeding on it? You know what it is that's affecting your life? are infecting your life, why do you keep exposing yourself to it? Why do you keep allowing those things to come over your radio or TV? You know they're not helpful. Why do you watch those things you know that are destructive to your life or your marriage? You have to make decisions. And there's no, there's no maturity. There's no deep fellowship. There's no walking with God outside genuine discipline in your life. You can grow lazy and fat in your spiritual life and you'll grow lean in your soul. It's a tragic sight. Add to that necessary surgery. And the only thing that can do the surgery properly is something that has to be sharper than the scalpel. There's only one thing that's sharper than a two-edged sword, and that's the Word of God. If there's a stronghold, if there's a behavior pattern, if there's a habit, if there's something that maintains in your life that you just, it keeps dragging you down and beating you up, then it's time to get serious about the Word of God and the application of the Word of God to that problem. There's a problem with the way I'm living my life. I clearly as a Christian know exactly what it is. Praise God for a concordance. <laughs> I can go to my concordance and find everything in the world about every scripture verse that deals with every problem I have a need of every promise that's needed to be claimed, every action that needs to be taken. It's in the Word of God. It's a living book so that when it's applied, it makes a difference. Some of you take blood pressure medicine. You take it once in the morning. You take it once in the evening. Some of you take some other kind of pill for this, another little pill for that. You take a discipline regimen. Some of you have the little pill boxes. Well, this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You know? Or you got little bottles lined up on the shelf. You know, I'm sick. I need to take this one twice a day. You know, and you do that. Follow the full regiment. Don't stop taking it till it's all taken. There's a word in the word for your dilemma. There's a word in the word that you can take and you can start putting that word in your heart. And you can start memorizing that word and you can meditate on that word and you can let that word breathe in you and over you and through you. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. And let God's word cut that out and clean it out. It is like a therapy that is so unique and so powerful and so supernatural. Only God can do it. Jesus said it like this. Now you are clean through my word. 
you're going to have to spend some time with God and get serious about His Word in relationship to where the need is. You've got to get to the heart because that's the source of all the problems. You say, what's the heart of the problem, Pastor? The problem with the heart. It's a problem with the heart. And we get our heart right. So I close this. Let me give you a, 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 a little treatment here. I'll give you the antibiotic for the day. The Lord will have to lead you through the rest of them, all right? Uh, you know, we, we, in the physical life, it's best to be, eat your vegetables, you know, and all the things with your vitamin C stuff and your fruits because it's got all those good antioxidants in it. Well, you know, one of the most powerful antioxidants is, is vitamin C. Well, there's three C's I want you to take with you today. All right, the three C's that'll, that'll help you through and, and, and you know, walk you through this, and we'll find them here. They're bouncing their way down. The first one is confession. You have to own it. Not blame somebody. You have to own it. You say, I'm messed up. I'm backslid. My heart's not right with God. And I'm on that road. I'm not down here yet, but I'm up here, and I'm seeing, the, you know, it's, it's a downhill. We're never static in our life, are we? We're either going forward or we're going back. There's no stationary spot in the Christian's life. We're either moving forward. Or we're regressing, we're falling back. And so it starts with just an admission. Now, I, I'm not what God wants me to be. I'm not where God wants me to be. I'm not doing what God's called me to do. I'm not acting the way God wants me to act. My, I've got issues with my hearing, my, my vision, my mouth, you know, issues of the heart. I, I, I need to confess my sins. First John 1 9, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. When? When we confess them. And that confession goes beyond just admittance. I hope you understand it. It has to do with repentance. Now, there's another aspect that once we do make genuine confession, the second C is cleansing, the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. I, I'm going to stop just for a second here because in my, in my heart, I'm hearing a real loud shout. Amen, I, say, I agree with that. All right. <laughs> the loud shout is there's power in the blood. There's still power in the blood. There's always been power in the blood. There'll always be power in the blood. If you have a need, there's power in the blood. If you have a sin, there's power in the blood. If you need victory, there's power in the blood. If you need to be cleansed, there's power in the blood. If you need grace, or not, there's power in the blood. And the application of the blood comes through me having a humble heart before God and confessing and admitting and repenting of my sins. And the confession is not just, as I said, I'm wrong, but it's an agreement with the Word of God and the claiming and the application of Jesus' blood. You want to deal with the insomnia issue and the guilt issue? The blood of Jesus is your answer. Somebody ought to shout. I mean, I don't know what's the matter with you. I, the, the weakness is set in, I know. It's so weak, it gets hard to hear this sometimes. But I desperately believe with all my heart as the pastor of Believer's Fellowship, that's the only one I can be accountable for, that if we don't get this today, we're going to be in trouble. Because there's some of you today who think you're there, who are so far from there, that if the truth were exposed, you'd be embarrassed this morning. That includes me. I don't want to live with a presumption, I'm right with God. God makes that judgment in our life. So we need to have that humble heart that says, God, I don't want to presume it. I want your righteousness, not mine. That's arrogance. I, I want to be humble for you, and I don't want to strut my stuff as though I've arrived when I hadn't even gotten near the neighborhood. Wash me, cleanse me thoroughly. Now catch this. This is the hard part. This is the hard vitamin to swallow. It's called commitment. Listen to this passage, and it's the answer of the martyrs during the time of tribulation, but it's applicable. They overcame him, those who lost their life for Jesus, overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. One passage says, they held not their lives dear unto themselves. In other words, they took their life and said, this is your life, God, do what you want. I mean, look at our lives in the view of what's getting ready to happen, what's already happening in the world today with martyrdom. People every day giving their life for Jesus, you know? And I don't remember which old revivalist or Puritan pastor I read this from years ago, but it always echoes in my heart when I think about a sermon like this. It, it, it read like this, is the way you're living your life right now worth Christ dying for? That's powerful, is it not? When I think about where I am, is this what Jesus had in mind when he said it's finished? This is what he wanted for Joe Arms when he said, pay for till I die. Let's never settle for mediocrity. Let's don't get down here in the rut. There's this issue in our life called commitment. And this is where I, I really do believe the problem, not just believers fellowship, but churches all across the Western hemisphere fall into this category. We don't want commitment. 
We want to pay somebody to do the children's work. We want to pay somebody to use work. We want to pay somebody to do the hospital visits. We want to pay somebody to lead the music. We want to pay somebody to do everything in the church so that all we have to do is come and sit in our little comfortable padded chairs and listen to a sermon we can say amen to. Got to get back to the place. Of the, I'm part of this ship, boys and girls. I'm on this boat. It's called Believer's Fellowship. I'm part of it. Sink, swim, or die. I'm going all the way for Jesus. I have never felt like quitting a job, stopping pastoring a church more than I have in the last six months. I have written my resignation letter at least 30 times. And then the other night, God just asked, how long are you going to stay in that little party you have in there? Little pity party. You enjoying that? I sent everybody invitations. Nobody showed up. We're getting little pity parties. Thank God for grace. Amen. Thank God. But folks, I'll let you know right now. There's no one person here can revive our church and restore our passion. It means you getting yourself right with God, me getting myself right with God, each and every one of us individually saying, I need to plug back in. But all too often when things get going, as I said earlier in the message, our natural, normal human tendency, ah, uh, I'm done, I need to withdraw. Hey, I'm retired, I don't need to do that. I was laughing at a pastor the other day, he called me, he, you know, he was voicing some things that had been on my heart. But he was asking me what to do. And the Lord has a wonderful sense of humor, doesn't he? And I just shared with him what the Lord was saying, what the Lord was doing. You know, take care of your business first. Get your heart right. Prioritize your life. Prioritize your walk. Prioritize where you're going. We have great days ahead of us. We have great ministry. We've got great, we have all the equipment we need. We have all the tools that we need. I mean, even in a physical sense, God has blessed us with great facilities and equipment and tools and people. We just need to do it. I mean, there's some things that are getting ready to happen in the turn in events of, in our church through, through different conferences, the men's conference, the women's conferences, the mission program, they're all coming up. These are all transformative actions that we can take or they can just be an event on a calendar. You know, the ladies can sit around and say, oh, they're going to do that ladies thing again. I wish we'd quit putting that stuff on the calendar. <laughs> you know, I got, I got something going that weekend. I got to go to the flower festival or whatever. The chili cook off the Renaissance. What's important? What's important? The attitude ought to be, I'm not only going to be at that conference, God, I'm going to invite every woman I know. Everybody, I have 367 people at my Facebook lackers. And I'm going to social media them to death until they get there. I have 1,400 names in my email. I'm going to hit them all. You know what I mean? People I have in my contacts list, we don't memorize phone numbers anymore, right? Hey, they're all right there. What are you doing in traffic? Just put that little phone on the speaker and hook it up there and just go down your contact list, ladies. Say, I want to invite you to our ladies' conference. You're stuck in traffic. You might as well invite somebody to church. Same for the men with the men's conference. There's so many things that we can do to change the life of so many people. How arrogant for us to sit around and just breathe our own air. Be preoccupied with your own stuff. If you find yourself backing up, stop it. Stop it now. Get for the Lord. Start moving forward. These are never days to retreat. These are days to sound the trumpet in Zion. These are the time for the church to arrive. It's time for the people. The world is sick and getting sicker by the second. It's our moment. Because where sin is, grace much more abounds. We need to rise to this moment and this time and this occasion and not just say it as this byline for such a time as this, but believe it. We are here for such a time as this. Let God get a hold of our hearts and our lives. Let me close with, a, with two quotes. One was by Charles Spurgeon. He made this statement in regard to backsliding. With deep repentance and sincere faith, find your way back from your backsliding. It is your duty. If you have turned away from him whom you profess to serve. Don't just say it. Do it. 
The other was a written from a prayer that was given by an old shepherd during the Welsh revivals. The, back in the 1600s, I guess it was, when the great Welsh revivals took place and people were getting saved all over the countryside and just falling under conviction, whole churches repenting, getting right with God. People turning on every turn, coming to know Christ as the Lord and Savior. But one of the Christians who experienced revival during that time, whom God used greatly, was an old, was an old shepherd. And he offered this prayer up in, 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 the, in, the, in one of the Welsh revival meetings. Here's what he said. He's kind of expressing his grief over his backsliding. Lord, I got among the thorns. I got among the briars. I was scratched and I was torn, bleeding. But Lord, it is only fair to say it was not on thy ground. I had wandered out of your pasture. If you're bleeding like that, and torn. It could well be you've wandered out of the place where the shepherd is feeding. To be where the Lord is, is to be where revival is. Because all that revival is, simply put, is a restoration to our fellowship. Genuine fellowship. Where I do believe he walks to me and he talks to me. He confirms that we're not alone. In my life, focuses and centralizes and flows out from him from the cross. Now, if you're just thinking, well, Brother Joe's just kind of gotten out of his head today, going a little crazy, and, you know, it'll, it'll be all right next week. I hope not. I hope not. What would stop anyone in this room today from saying, you know, I need to start with that first vitamin confession and claiming the blood of Jesus and committing. But making excuses for why I don't do this and why I don't give and why I don't come or why I don't attend or why I don't serve or why I don't witness or why I don't pray or why I don't read my Bible. Come back to the cross of Jesus and see there at Calvary your Savior, wounded and bleeding, poor sinners bleeding, dying. Would you stand with your heads bowed?